Namaste and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our continuing series, Evenings with Shadalu. Namaste. Namaste. And happy to be with all of you. We are happy to continue today our series, part three, on the same subjects, dreams, visions, out-of-body experiences. And we will start with a comment that we received from Shanta last time on Korat Halvar example. <laughs> Where <do you> <laughs> yes. when, when we were speaking of memory and the ability to be able to recall everything from the subliminal mind, in the chat box, Shanta had put this Kuratalvar example. And while reading, I couldn't quite recall what it was. <clears throat> so I thought it useful to uh, draw upon this as a reference. This is a very famous incident where a very well-known and highly respected saint of the South, Sri, Ramaj Sri Ramanujacharya, had gone, traveled all the way to Kashmir to have access to a particular text, which were called the musings of Bodhayana. Vritti is the term, musings. And Bodhayana is, uh, his musings were known as uh, Brahma Sutras. I'm drawing largely from Wikipedia. And he wanted to make a commentary for which he wanted to read this text. And going there, there was some resistance from the scholars there. And they did not allow him to take notes from the text. He was only allowed to read. On the way back, it's a long journey, which is made largely on foot. And so having come back, so much had been lost as if from the memory. But it turns out his primary disciple, Kura Talwar, had been able to memorize entirely the whole text. And obviously, maybe one reading or a couple of readings were enough for him to be able to retain word for word. And so, as a result, Ramanujacharya could complete his commentary on the Brahma Sutras. So, this is a famous example given. And the point I wanted to make uh, in relation to this, which was part of our discussion, in all of us, within our subliminal mind, there is total recall. There is no exception to this. That's the nature of the subliminal mind. You will find Sri Aurobindo's writings on education. He speaks of two memories. There is the automatic memory, and he says, and there's the conscious memory. The automatic memory is perfect already. It does its job irrespective. And it's the conscious memory which has to be trained on how to access the automatic memory. And we discussed that last time. But the important thing with regard to this incident of Kura Talbar is it was in the context of a spiritual path. Kura Talwar was a disciple of Ramanujacharya, highly developed spiritually. And as a result of the spiritual development, this capacity had come. There are people who have it without the spiritual development. And you are given a name, um, ideatic memory, I think it's called. But always it comes from a prior life in which this capacity had been developed or occasionally it comes from in this life where there is a physical damage to the link in between or to the brain or something in the inner nervous system where suddenly as if gates open abnormally and there is an access. The better thing of course for us is to be able to consciously integrate sufficiently that we are able to have that access and the continuity of the memory. The point for us from a spiritual point of view. It's not that your memory and your intelligence have to be developed by a long process as science teaches us. So science will say, ah, yes, so-and-so is more intelligent, so-and-so is genius, and you must now build your capacity. You're told this, study, learn, read in school. And as a result, you will grow more intelligent, you'll develop your capacity for memory, you'll develop, etc. Yes, it does work, but that's not the true secret. It works because in trying to do these things, the inner capacity which is already existent now gets a chance to, so to say, leak out. So it's a very indirect method. The more direct method would be, you consciously turn your awareness inward, upward, 
until you are able to integrate with the inner and higher parts and let them flow into the outer and lower parts and immediately your memory capacity will shoot up your intelligence capacity will shoot up to at least a genius level and possibly more and all other faculties similarly since we are talking about the mind it's limited to what the mind can do but an equivalent exists in the inner vital and even in the inner physical and to the extent that you are able to open to the inner vital and the inner physical at those levels and integrate sufficiently the capacities latent to those levels proper now begin to infuse into the outer and sri aurobindo actually says this is actually what happens in evolution evolution is nothing but the latent abilities in the inner realms now being organized in the surface layers and the surface layer is characterized by the fixation in the biology now the fixation when our consciousness identifies with the physical body that fixation can become extremely rigid to a point where as if we lose all memory of the inner and higher things we've forgotten why we took birth but also we lose with it all the abilities which are natural to the inner layers but with that fixation also can come such a dulling that we even forget to try to recall and turn entirely outwards and this is the great loss but if the inner being is strong enough it keeps nudging pulling and begins to make this turn and movement or infuses from within certain experiences and so on and that's how our spiritual journey typically begins <clears throat> but if from the beginning we understood the psychology and made the effort to turn within and above and build that link and made that even the basis for our educational training not just of mind but of the vital and the physical then so much more can be achieved in a very short time in other words what would be a long slow process of evolution for the outer layers through this indirect method could be enormously accelerated by the opening to the inner and higher just opening to the inner would open you to a level which we may call mystic opening to the higher would open you to a level which we may call more spiritual but in effect the procedure or the process for both is exactly the same again to the inward opening we use indirect methods typically what people use as mantras or various practices and rituals they are all indirect methods and we can do the same thing by direct turning of awareness and then plunging within and we have discussed the indirect and direct methods in the series of discussions from the evening series number 82 onwards where we go into the deeper aspects of practice so those of you who have not seen those do look at it uh, we can go to the next question one letter we had received from tutul decades back i had a dream where i saw my son a little boy of 1 2 years falling in the running water of a river i got scared and watched him fall and moving away due to the strong force of the water even in the dream i felt fear due to which i was not able to jump in the river and rescue him when i got up i was deeply distressed in agony and angry at myself not being able to rescue my son that i got scared that i would die if i had to jump in the running water ironically i'm a very good swimmer in real life I cried and prayed so much that day prayed that the dream reappears again and I will be given the opportunity to make the necessary changes evening I meditated became calm by that time I was already initiated into Paramahamsa Yogananda initial meditation techniques I started concentrating on the dream and I was very calm prayed for the dream to reappear again that night the same dream appeared so my son falling into the river the water flow was very strong but i jumped into the river to pick the boy up and what happens is astonishing the water level is just my knee height and i easily pick up my, my son who is happy and safe in real life after dream my son and me were put in life situations where i had to put my energy focus and sacrifice for my son 
And those years were very stressful. I had to single handle by the responsibility for him. But today, after 12 years, I can say everything went out smoothly and successful for my son. It's an in <clears throat> interesting example of a dream and an intervention that took place in a dream. And I've kept the whole thing in some detail because there are many lessons one can draw from this example and certain nuances of the example. So you see, first of all, that as a mother, her child is falling in a running river. She experiences fear in the dream. Although in real life, she's a good swimmer. The fear comes up to a degree that the force of the water and the strength of the force triggering a fear that she is unable to jump and rescue. Now think about what this means. In physical life, had it happened, she would have jumped because she knows she is a swimmer. In the dream state, she is not able to jump. Why would that be? And I want to take this uh, point as a reference for understanding the importance of these kinds of dreams symbolic or experience dream experiences because it shows that while in the physical body in the physical surface consciousness these capacities and even this courage is there had the child fallen really in the water the instinct of the mother would just make her jump even if she didn't know how to swim and being a good swimmer she would have had no fear at all in the dream though this does not happen instead the fear comes what does it mean that the dream took place at a certain level of consciousness in which that fear exists. The fear is not of swimming. Remember, it's a symbolic dream. The fear is of this overwhelming force that is sweeping away the child. In that state, the instinct of a mother which is in the biology is not present. Now what the child represents for her is not just that instinctive bond. It is something else. And as she sweeps this over, see, she sees this overwhelming current taking him away. The fear of that current is what paralyzes her in that grade of consciousness. Now, what does that mean in practice? In real life, when a certain crisis would have happened, let's say a few weeks, months, or years down, the force of that current which was seen in the dream would be felt in different situation, not as water, not as a river, but as a force of overwhelming circumstances, which is taking away something which is precious to her. It could be towards her son, it could be towards something which to her represents that. But the overwhelming force being such that within her, there would be a paralysis. Remember, it has nothing to do with swimming. So the swimming instinct of the biology will not kick in. It will be this overwhelming fear of being carried away by the circumstances, which is too intense, too difficult to bear, to manage. And this would be the reality of physical life. And at that point, she would have watched helplessly that situation overwhelm her and pass on and take away something precious of her. Need not have been specifically the sun. Maybe it was the sun, maybe it was something else, but something which meant the equivalent of her own child, of herself, a part of herself put out, which is precious, perhaps even more precious than herself, being swept out by the overwhelming circumstances. The grade of consciousness which would have been so paralyzed was the grade in which the dream took place and she experienced that paralysis. I want to show you this because you have to understand the dream is not merely something which happens as a symbolism. It represents parts of you activated in that situation or inactivated or affected. Which same parts would be activated or inactivated or affected in exactly the same way in those material life circumstances. So it's like a, we may say, simulation where you're having a practice session exposed to that same force, but with a difference. And this was what happened in her case. When she wakes up, she realizes this. Of course, largely the mind is going in the interpretation. Oh, my son, I didn't save. I can swim. It was largely on the superficial part. But the compulsion was 
I want to have that opportunity again to be able to change that outcome. And as a result of that concentration and intensity, once again, that simulation situation is activated. But at this time, because she has prepared herself, I will even use the word, there was a sadhana of an intensity of uh, purpose, which had been built up through the whole day. And the intensity of wanting to intervene to change that outcome. All that gathered force now is activated in that grade of consciousness. That grade of consciousness is taught to overcome the fear, step in and change the outcome. Now, again, from a very material perspective, because we think of dreams as something unreal, hallucinatory, and uh, imagina imaginary, but not understanding that these are realities on other planes, corresponding to gradations within you. So in reality, she was able to change something in herself and be able to overcome the fear of that overwhelming force and save the child. So the specific intervention in the symbolism actually corresponded to a change of consciousness within her. And then immediately as she jumps into the river, she finds the water is just knee height and she is able to pick up the sun and he's happy and safe. Now this is critical, uh, typically happening in dreams or in out of body experiences. Because remember, in the domain which is non-material, form is plastic. And so everything you see, everything you experience is in some sense a reflection of the states of consciousness. When you fear, you set up a relationship where the thing that you fear now becomes large and overwhelming. You become small. When you face directly and shift your relationship of consciousness, you are no more afraid. In the relation, you become large, that becomes small. In relative relation. The same circumstance, which was deep water, rushing, intense water, etc., which would have been overwhelming, the moment you changed your relationship with it and overcame the fear, the circumstance shifted. I would even presume, although she has not mentioned it, that the intensity of the water flow itself would have subsided when she felt it was knee, high, knee height, and she would have said, oh, even the water is quite calm and still and not at all disturbing, not at all overwhelming. Because you change the relationship, the material dream circumstances, formed circumstances of the dream change accordingly. We'll come back to this many times in many ways, even in out-of-body experiences, when there is this question of uh, challenges, dangers placed before you. What do you do? The fact that you face it without fear is one way by which you overcome. You ignore it as if it's a trivial thing. That's another way you overcome. But basically, you're changing your relationship with the thing. And as a result, that thing becomes the relationship that you have set. I will explore this a little later with a different question, but um, I want to highlight that what is happening in dream state is actually something happening in your consciousness, which corresponds to an actual material circumstances, where if you make that shift in the dream state, you have changed and therefore are able to act differently in the material circumstances of the world. And if the dream itself was as if a precursor to the events happening in the material world, the fact that you shifted things there will actually create a chain reaction and change the circumstances here physically. This is a point Sri Aurobindo makes in one of the letters. We will look at those texts and letters next time. We'll go much more deeply in Sri Aurobindo's writings. Today, I want to just take up many of the questions relating to the dreams. And once we understand this, uh, those writings would make much more sense. So what you do in the dream state is not only an expression of what you are, but if in that state you're able to overcome and change yourself or change the circumstances, that reflects in the material circumstances, not only in the chain of influence, but in the growth that you have had, which then with which you are able to intervene differently. I recall one lady I had met, she was a teacher in some school, and uh, she had always dreams of battles, struggles and fights, where she would be this heroic person overcoming challenges, defeating, sometimes killing people as if in a battleground and things like that. Uh, it represents a part of her consciousness, which in this life 
was not at all expressed superficially but a heroic part a struggling part an effort to overcome and change circumstances defeat anything which is opposing uh, the overall sense of direction of life and so on but the fact that that was being exercised there would have had its consequences here without even the person on the surface knowing assuming the dreams were completely forgotten you would not even know that there had been an intervention by your own efforts on a higher level which has changed circumstances and such things do happen remember there are many levels on which things happen so on other levels we do have interactions sometimes and even interventions which have their consequences here and we will read that in sri aurobindo's text probably next time so i wanted to uh, somewhat dwell on this and then as it happens she describes uh, later in real life there had a, there was a difficult situation and this energy and focus and self sacrifice the willingness to lose yourself to save your child but also with a certain forcefulness of being able to overcome without fear without shrinking without being paralyzed and helpless in the face of an intensity of a flow that having been learnt and overcome had its consequence materially also so we can go to the next question i have another question very similar from caroline i had a dream that was so vivid i remembered it after a year i was in the local swimming pool with my baby and we were in the water and i was called away to do something and i left my baby in the water i then realized that i left my baby and ran back to the pool and got there just as the baby was going under i dived in and brought the baby up just in time as i lifted the baby out of the water it looked at me and said sorry i had some ideas of what the dream mean but the sorry is difficult to understand any light on this dream would be appreciated <laughs> it is one of those dreams where it's very difficult to recognize because it is so different from material circumstances and that's why you have to shift your consciousness a bit within in this case a child which is almost sinking in water you pull it out and the child tells you sorry doesn't make sense right because the water is not a drowning in the local pool that's the imagery in which the physical mind has retained an experience of a deeper layer and so on this level it doesn't make sense but if you go back to the full sense of it the water represents a domain of consciousness the baby we mentioned last time sri aurobindo's indication that often it represents the psychic being or some deeper part of which is close to the psychic being so she is in the water inside you see another thing with the swimming pool is when you are in the water you are not wearing your regular clothes you are in your minimal clothing and in the water you're fully immersed and you're with the baby immediately the sense is of being in a deeper layer immersed in a deeper layer in presence of the psychic and it was a state of consciousness or represented a phase of her life but then something changes now she gets attracted to something which is outside the pool and she is called away to do something and leaves the baby behind because obviously the baby belongs to the water in the inner domain she can't bring the baby she has to leave it behind by itself it's not a problem you just left it behind because it stays where it is you go outside you're called out but then comes this where she remembers i have left that behind i have lost something i'm about to lose something so she rushes back to gain it meanwhile what's happening the baby which is in the water is gently drifting in sinking into the water going under which is what happens when the psychic influence is strongly in front you ignore it long enough after a while it begins to withdraw sinking into the water deeper waters of consciousness she goes back because she senses she has lost something she goes back and draws it out and the child says sorry because it was withdrawing because it felt it was no more needed its influence was no more received it had begun to recede when she comes back and it says sorry therefore sorry i was withdrawing but here i'm there 
So I, it'll be interesting for Caroline to look whether in that period there was such a situation or immediately after. Sometimes these things are indicative of events to happen. Sometimes they indicate something that's already happening at that moment, but you're not conscious because it's happening somewhere deeper on other layers. So it'll be interesting for her to see if at that moment circumstances of life had called her out very strongly and she'd begun to lose the contact with the inner presence. And then there was the corrective movement of reconnecting and drawing back that influence. It would be interesting to see, but uh, it seemed to me almost obvious that this was a sense of the dream experience itself. And that's why it remains vividly because it represents something so precious to the spiritual life. We can go to the next question. We have two parts of uh, Sun's question. So I'll read the first one. Can the same thing as sleep paralysis happen in any operation? My body didn't want to go for the surgery and just wanted to be left alone. A peace invocation has started automatically hours before, prior to my knowledge uh, of what lay ahead of me. But the doctors felt it an emergency. Something in me was still invoking peace and stilled, went numb much before and during the process. A bit detached from what was being done to the body and I didn't like all the intense pressure of the situation. It was a local anesthetic, so I was fully awake during the during the, the procedure. But then midway felt like was passing away into a peace, which I had felt before going to the hospital and kept trying to be awake and talking, which was hard as the inner silence was blissful. Later in recovery, felt unusually cold and my body shivered for hours and needed layers of blankets and heated bed sheets before I felt normal again. It took almost a day to regain back a higher BP and normal body warmth. What was this reason for shivering? Even in recovery, the peace and stillness stayed with me for the next couple of days, except for the interference of doctors and pressure to take optional drugs and painkiller, which nothing in my being wanted. And this constant feeling of being pulled out from inside didn't feel good. I felt it would heal naturally if left alone with the intuition, but didn't know how to fight the outside fear and pressure. Any light on where I was drifting to and the numb stillness? Months before this day, when I had no idea of the situation, I had a dream of my body laying on a wooden table with family and doctors around while I was watching my body from above. Does this mean my physical body died in the dream in order for me to watch from above? Okay. This is not directly of a dream experience, but it's the parallel. And his question is, does the same thing happen as when you wake up from a dream and you have sleep paralysis? And there's something similar which has happened, but in waking state during or before a surgery. So the second part of this is to do with the dream that did occur from a few months before. And I would suggest that the dream itself was prophetic of this event. As you can see, the event was traumatic on many levels, psychologically, maybe not so much biologically, but much more psychologically. And so it would have been sensed or anticipated as imminent and was represented in the dream state where you saw the thing happening from above as if. It does not mean that you're in the dream your body has to die. It's just a glimpse of, uh, well, a symbolic glimpse of something which is about to happen. You must understand the inner worlds and higher worlds are all not primarily domains of form. So do not attach too much to form. Do not attach to meaning of form in the material world and in our physical senses. The sense of it is completely different. And you have to familiarize yourself to being in a domain which is, so to say, 
distinct from the surface material consciousness and its values when you go deep into meditation for example the values are very different the priorities are very different your state your perception everything is different habituate yourself to that and then from that you will understand many of these things better so it does not have to be literal in in general assume it is not literal but it is indicative of perhaps in this case just the event which took place and what was the event there was a surgery to be made and he didn't want to go to the surgery and uh, automatically before the surgery this invocation started in the middle of it uh, he was drawn to the surgery because of an emergency he feels himself detached from what's happening in the body and although there was a local anesthetic he is fully aware uh, in the mind awareness but it's as if passing away into a peace which i had felt before going to the hospital and kept trying to be in and then of course he was required to speak but the inner silence was blissful so this movement of the withdrawal into an deep inner peace which took place almost spontaneously is what i want to point to and i want to make a parallel from this to several aspects spiritual as well as uh, more, more material this happened because your inner being pulled you deep within it could also happen that you on the surface in order to avoid the strain the struggle the shock choose as if to want to withdraw it's the term used in modern psychology is dissociate separate from your body but when you separate in dissociation where do you go what is this you and it could take many directions it could simply be a part of your mind as if standing back separately and watching but in this case there was an inward pull two reasons one is either externally as you wanted to dissociate a memory of a deeper immersion came forward to assist and helped you to do an inward dissociation rather than a sideways dissociation if in this life you have already had experiences of deep meditation it would be obvious but from the nature of the question it seems like that's not the case so i would suggest it's coming from a past life and the inner being being sufficiently awake that was the way the second variation to this is you may not have it you may not have wanted to do it the inner being surges forward at that point either to infuse an influence into you during a crisis or to draw you back into itself wrap you and hold you in its peace in its depth to prevent you from being overwhelmed by that difficult situation now this is often what happens to people at the time of external crisis sometimes there is a sudden death in the family unexpectedly sometimes there is an ac- accident that begins to happen and you are as if pulled back so that the intervention can be of a different kind or it does happen you are in a kind of a shock there is this t- phrase used shell shock there is a shell explosion the loud bang and you are in a state of shock but what is the nature of the shock that you are unable to function normally your consciousness dissociated and if there is something of the inner spiritual influence it could have pulled you in if it is a sideways dissociation you are just dysfunctional you are kind of lost you don't even you lose your sense of identity etc it's a superficial thing but if there is a deeper pulling it draws you in then there is this experience which he describes where um it was passing into a deep peace the inner silence was blissful he says and he didn't want to come out with the interference of the doctors giving all the medicines the constant feeling of being pulled out from inside didn't feel good i felt it would heal naturally if left alone with the intuition this came because you were in a deepened interiorized state and coming out is almost such a loss of that deep peace and freedom and joy that uh, it feels like not worth it so but still in that state you have the deep conviction that everything will be set right if you were to come out and lose that inner state all the usual reactions of panic fear worry might automatically kick in if from this inner state 
you were able to infuse this deep peace into those outer parts and especially in the parts where the surgery was done or the layers upon which the imprint of the surgery was held then it would have actually accelerated the healing but even if doing nothing there was a certain infusion so intuitively you felt that uh, it was fine but he says i didn't know how to fight the outside fear and pressure this would be the way you stay in this and gently very slowly infuse like a vibration like an influence like a perfume spreading out infuse it into those layers where you feel the fear and pressure and as you infuse it you will feel those parts relax calm down become still and quiet begin to reflect the inner state now all this as i am describing you will immediately recognize as the very nature of the spiritual process you go within to a deeper or a higher consciousness experience it remain immersed in it and then you have to infuse it all the way into the outer if you don't you just come out well you've left it behind outside everything is the same you lost an opportunity but when you take the trouble to infuse in this way you can feel the shift that takes place and the change in the outer consciousness this must be done so from the experience itself it seems and i would suggest for son that uh, there is a deeper spiritual let's say past work done which made possible for you not only to easily come into that state but stay in it easily but now you must use this as a reference to consciously go into that state and you can use the memory of it recall the peace recall the deep sense of inward immersion and so to say let yourself slide let yourself be carried into the feel that the memory brings back and let yourself be pulled almost what happened in that crisis situation was you were drawn in you were pulled by who your own deeper ranges allow yourself to be drawn in in the same way no more needing a crisis externally and then one of the things which happens when you are so inwardly drawn and deeply drawn where your consciousness withdraws from the surface layers automatically your consciousness is no more identified with the surface body as a result it feels as if the outer layer becomes completely still or even numb there is a pleasant numbness it's not a, a disturbing numbness you are in inwardly centered the outer layers become numb it happens for most people when you go into deep states of meditation but then when you come back instead of reacting oh my body is numb blood circulation is cut off and you start shaking your legs instead you just let your consciousness once again infuse instead of agitating the surface you leave them quiet and slowly infuse what you have received in that inner state slowly infuse into it and you'll find within a few minutes all the sensations return it has nothing to do with blood circulation the numbness is filled with the warmth and um, all else what she describes later and the peace will fill into it and so when you come back to your surface you will feel the continuity of the deeper peace maybe not with the same depth not with the same denseness but the continuity of it will be there as an influence so initially you will do this later what will happen you will be able to hold both poises as if some part of you is deeply immersed there and another part of you is receiving its influence in the surface in the stillness and then something else can happen later you as this integrates more and more you can actually live in the deep peace and literally flow it into all the outer parts acting working through those outer parts there'll be no more the sense of numbness because you'll not have withdrawn the initial need for withdrawal is almost necessary to be able to go to that kind of depth at first later when you integrate to the surface and are able to go back and forth and a continuity is built and you can live in a double awareness and then eventually live from the inner flowing into the outer you will no more have the numbness but you will have the full impact of that inner state so i'm explaining why there was this numbness in the deep peace and it felt cold and the body shivered for hours needing layers of blankets heated bed sheets before i felt normal he says because actually it was not a physical cold it was the state of having withdrawn from the physical that the body was numb 
biologically the temperatures could be brought back but you were not feeling the warmth you were feeling it still cold and numb because your consciousness was withdrawn you infuse the consciousness back into it and you'll find immediately it takes care of that cold so it was not a physical cold so it did not help that you put the blankets or the heaters so i think uh, this should be clear enough for what happened i'm just trying to see if there are other aspects interference of doctors etc and the painkillers and drugs felt an interference because it was artificially pulling you out whereas being within felt so good but i'm interested to know what happened later after this crisis passed did you find yourself suddenly thrown out or did it gradually emerge and if it gradually emerged were you able to go back in did you even attempt to go back in these would be the important things if you have not i would suggest you do this use this as an occasion use this as an entry into a spiritual depth of experience and it may help if you like to look at the guided meditation in the about 2 years ago in september i had uploaded on the same channel it's in the playlist of the evenings with shradhalu series also i think just after episode number 84 between 84 and 85 this uh, title which is called guided meditation for descent of peace you might like to uh, explore that where there's a concentration above head and the descent of peace that takes place which will take you to a similar state and maybe initially not fully but if you get it fully even in the first time wonderful otherwise after a few repetitions of deepening consciously you'll find you can easily get back to that same depth but then you must consciously work on integrating in this way but this shows the spiritual potential and what is waiting from within except that what happens for many of us and i've seen this in so many cases of people who have a spiritual potential we are so busy with the outward turn it needs a crisis for the inner intervention something to draw you in or something to infuse from within out to seize the situation to help in the crisis and so on you will remember the example sri aurobind narrates when he was on the horse carriage and there was an accident about to happen in baroda and he found something of the inner being surged out overwhelmed the circumstances seized the situation and prevented the accident and he is surprised at what's happening he being the surface person but you don't have to wait for a crisis rather we, this would be an experience an entry point use it to build and deepen your spiritual life we can go to his next question his second part um, please elaborate on dreams of family members if they are living it is about parts attached to them also about that family close one like a parent immediately after death and even 2 3 years after regular dreams sometimes in gas gaps of few weeks months where you can see entire family together again like eating together or traveling or enjoying simple moments with them or harder circumstances tussles similar to intenser lighter to the tussles during your life together on earth or sometimes they are trying to make amends and sometimes justify or do more of of the same thing to justify or sometimes neutral dreams of just seeing them what these different scenes means are they actually visits it could be any of these and i'm taking the question more generally because all these possibilities are um, likely but then depending on the specific nature of the dream and the state and the quality and the way it was registered that you would make out which of these it would be for example if you were to surround yourself with pictures of your family members living or those who have passed on think about it all the time remember those events miss them feel them long for them naturally this state in which you are will reflect in the dream state in which either the same longing will be enormously amplified or you will feel them close to you and you will feel the thing which you are missing which you are seeking now and experience them now depending on what happens on the grade of the dream it could simply be 
a reflection of something which is within you, in which case, obviously, they are not there. Or it's possible that your intense longing and perhaps they're missing you also makes for a contact that takes place in the subtle bodies. Need not be in a full exteriorization. It can be still just in a part of the consciousness that is as if projected out, often in the domain, which is what we will call the mental body. Because in the mental body, you don't even need to exteriorize in order to be able to enter in contact with things. You think of someone and a part of your mind has already touched their mind. But it's only on that level. So in the dream state, if you are thinking of them, they are thinking of you and missing you and something happens and touches. Which you will then recall on waking up as having met them. But when they meet you, what happens? Depending on the nature of your relationship, you have the tussles or the intense or light, but replica of the similar things which used to happen in the physical domain. So again, what value does it have? Nothing particular. You're only replicating what happens here in consciousness terms. But if we draw on the examples from the previous discussions, you decide, in the dream, I don't want those conflicts. And make a change there. Make amends, as you have seen them do. You change something there, you come back on the physical world, something will have shifted. You don't need to always do it in the dream state. You can do it in the physical consciousness. So you are in your waking state. What is it that is the root cause of this tussle that you have with, let's say, a family member? And you observe in yourself this part, this anxiety, this fear, this upset, or this point of discord. And you consciously dissolve and change and replace it with a positive relation. And sometimes these are deep-rooted. You're not always conscious. And then you find the moment your vibrational state here has changed, it will reflect in the dream state. It will reflect in your material circumstances. When they call you, you'll find suddenly the tensions have dissolved, etc. And sometimes you can see it's, it's quite complex because it may be justified. You're upset, your tension, because of their constant provocation, you've built up a certain reaction. Can you actually dissolve that and be free of it even when the provocations come? That's difficult. But if you're able to do that and hold that, then you'll find suddenly something of the provocations dissolving or softening up or changing mood. So it was something which my teacher MP Pandit had shared. And it was a guidance that the mother gave to him. She said, you know, all these people who are, he was harassed by a lot of people who, who were jealous or had issues with him. And uh, she said, do you know what to do with your enemies? The I, first she had said simply be unaffected and equal. But then she said, you really want to solve it? This is the way to go. She said, you must love. And Pandiji commented when he was sharing this example, he said uh, that he has to um, accept that he couldn't do it. It was too difficult. But the, it depends, of course, on the circumstances. But when you can do it, First, you simply dissolve whatever distress you have. Bring a state of general equality. And then you can actually flow in love. You don't have to love them for their nastiness. What you do rather is put out a general perception or relation of love with all. Make it neutral. Make it collective. And then when you have that, occasionally when this X passes before you, that neutrality or that love which is generally turned to the collective will still be present. Occasionally, you'll find ripples of the old habit popping up, but then it's easy to dissolve when you already have this base. But if you sit down and say, I'm going to love X who has hurt me so much, it doesn't work. Instead, you're pumping more energy into them with this distress, which only creates more of the reaction. I'm going to go off in a bit of a tangent, but it, you'll understand why. Uh, but it goes a little beyond the scope of our discussion. What actually happens each time you think of somebody with a distress, and maybe the distress is justified, but each time you think of somebody with distress, your consciousness is thinking of them. And so let's say at the mental plane, at least there's a point of contact. And then there is an emotional distress. Where do you think that distress goes? Because you've just created a link, the distress flows directed at them. Not intentionally, but since 
it's associated with them that distress now hangs around and eventually wanders off with the link already present touches them at a level which is subliminal they are not conscious at that moment spontaneously for no reason at all they are led to think of you or remember you and at the moment where the consciousness turns and thinks of you they are hit by this bundle of distress which is yours for them but now when it hits them it's felt as their distress towards you now so when they do that and their distress pops up for no reason this oh i don't know why i don't know i don't know why i don't like this person that distress dislike comes back to you eventually and you have actually built a connection of attention which is building and builds over days over weeks now the incident initially in which the problem started might be trivial you're working together x was in a bad mood for a reason unconnected with you they're struggling with some problem they've had with someone in their family or some financial situation when you went to them with a lot of affection you got a response which was gruff and harsh they may not even be conscious that they were like that because they were in some distress already you come back and say this person does not like me why is this person so nasty to me and you start brooding and start this vicious cycle throwing that energy which touches them comes back and forth and builds an intensity a bridge of distress of disturbed energy linking you the result is now two weeks later you meet for the first time after that incident and suddenly there's this tension in the air and it justifies all your worries if you're not careful or if you're careful you notice where did this come from i cannot think of any physical circumstance that would justify this tension but it's there so you dissolve it and this was the key that the mother gave to dissolve it you can of course start by a process of cultivating the opposite which would be a good way cultivating neutrality etc but you really want to dissolve it the most rapid the most direct way is if you can melt it all with love and as i said it doesn't have to be towards that person necessarily it can be generally put out to all and it includes that person incidentally but in that which you put out this tendency that you have to build that link of distress dissolves <coughs> the link of distress you have built up begins to dissolve because you're not feeding it anymore the distress that comes from them which is now the habit of this link as it reaches you it meets this love and dissolves the vicious cycle is not only broken it begins to dissolve rapidly not just with them but with everybody because it was a general turn and if you can work on it and don't worry if you slip occasionally don't worry if something um, rattles you when you meet them or whoever because the distress is justified but you can't be feeding it you can't be living and wallowing in it the love allows you to break free from the need to wallow you'll still be careful you'll still be hesitant of certain kinds of trust or interaction but at least you will not be wallowing in that and feeding this cycle so the love generally put out in this way in as a relationship with all and generally to life itself to the world allows you to most rapidly dissolve these things so i've gone into a bit of a tangent but uh, it it's an opportunity to build on this all relationship with family members and i come back to the question now whatever this if in the dream you have tussles which are harder or lighter that's not what you want will start changing them now in your waking state what is also interesting in the example of some of the dreams you've mentioned uh, is that sometimes you have these dreams where they are trying to make amends or sometimes trying to justify or do more of the same thing to justify and that's actually this what we were describing this links built up which are habitual mechanical on some inner layers break that cycle with this love do it in your waking state if you can from that extend it into as you drift into sleep let that love turn to all family members all friends all beings if you want go into sleep with that what will happen is this will begin to dissolve 
many of the dreams you're describing seem to be just representations of these kinds of distress links that have formed on those levels. But uh, coming to general question about family members and seeing members from the past or who have passed on, as a general rule, uh, often Sri Aurobindo says the death of somebody is indicative of a dissolution of some part in you which, which was attached, which was sticky, which corresponded to that grade of consciousness of that relation. So I think that largely covers. We can go to the next question. Madhuri, once I was awake early morning, Suddenly, all space and things around me was turned into vast blue sky full of stars. I saw a man sitting on galaxy plate, came near to me, whirling and widening, and turned into Sri baby Krishna with his toes in mouth, smiling at me. I couldn't recognize even him as Krishna. Suddenly, it struck my mind to bow down as he is Krishna. I went into reverse direction. And then... So we'll, we'll just look at this first. Yeah, okay. Uh, early morning dreams are generally indicative of something which is close to the material plane because your consciousness is coming back. And that's generally when you have the precognitive dreams because that layer, when you perceive things happening, they're closest to the material and are therefore likely to happen. If you perceive things on a higher level, by the time they come to the material, there are too many interventions and changes. It may not happen. So that early morning stage is interesting because it's the closest to the material. And then she describes, Madhuri describes how all space around turned into this vast blue sky full of stars. Notice the sense of that blue sky full of stars and immediately of the sense of the cosmos and opening to a wide, vast cosmos. And then there is this man sitting on a galaxy plate. I'm assuming that you're seeing the galaxy or perhaps as an image. So it's an opening to some kind of a vast cosmic kind of consciousness. And then as this form emerges, it becomes this child with toes in mouth smiling, baby Krishna. So in the tradition, for example, it is described how in this dissolution from one cycle to the next of one kalpa, that is when one age, gigantic cycle of age dissolves and everything is as if extinguished and a new cycle is born. In between, it is the divine Lord as this child with his uh, toe in his mouth playing. That's all you see. That's all that remains because the whole game is his. And it's an image which is quite classic traditionally. But again, it need not draw on that. What I'm saying is it is a perception of the divine playing at the heart of the whole cosmos, at the cosmic, in the cosmic consciousness. And the mind takes a while to register it as a familiar form of and with the name of Sri Krishna. And once it recognizes this, then the being, the whole experience withdraws. So it's as if from above something descended touched you, gave you an experience and withdrew. And again, this is to highlight that actually in our sleep state, often, especially when we are on a spiritual path, we may receive such touches of consciousness, infusions, even experiences are given to us because often in those states, we are much more receptive than in the embodied state. And in those states, one can even receive and integrate without memory remaining on the surface. So what will happen is something, so to say, trickles down through repeated series of experiences, things begin to change. But if on the surface you have no memory of it, all these changes are happening on some inner layers and they take a long time to come to the surface. And that's unfortunately too slow as a sadhana. And this is the reason why it is extremely helpful to take the trouble to bridge the gap between the inner and the outer. And if you can consciously do this a little bit, maybe by some regular practice of meditation, I don't know if Madhuri has a regular practice of meditation, but I would suggest doing one, but not one which is superficial, not one where your consciousness stays on the surface, but really withdraw, go deep within, and immersion in the presence 
within you. Whatever means you use, but stay in the deep immersion and in that immersion, turn and open to these inner and higher ranges of your consciousness. And if this could be given to you in the dream state, and remaining, remembering only a vague imprint of it, when you go within consciously and open, you will receive the same and perhaps receive much more completely and be able to retain it and allow it to impact your surface consciousness and your life. So again, I would suggest this is a indication of a deeper spiritual potential. And do not stop with superficial kinds of meditation, but allow your consciousness to be drawn deeper within and open from within. And then you will find you have access to these things and much more that is perhaps waiting. You can go to her next question. <clears throat> Second, in another dream, I was in dream, was on a dead body stretcher made of bamboo kept on fire. I was not scared. My body was burning and breaking into pieces. And I was a little confused what was happening. And I was talking to somebody, filling the hole. I could see my body burning from outside and I was in the body talking at the same time. If this experience has little indications from spiritual perspective, and I'm not able to explore, can you please help me in getting those indication and significance? Yes. So obviously the first experience was of a spiritual kind, as I've mentioned. The second one also is indicative of a certain transition perhaps. Uh, so at the same time, she feels herself in the body while it is burning. Uh, and being broken up, so to say, and at the same time standing outside and observing. And the thing is, while in the body is talking, I would suggest this represents the two layers of your life, the superficial surface life and the inner, deeper spiritual life. Lack of the link, they're separate. And this one is talking, it is doing its thing. <laughs> and Confused, breaking up, burning, which is really what our life is about. We are being consumed as we travel the journey of life meaninglessly, pointlessly. And all the circumstances wear out the body, break us up. And basically we age, break down and so to say, die out. Lose hope, lose enthusiasm, lose energy, lose sense of purpose. Basically that's a fragmentation of the whole outer personality. That's what you see in an aimless, meaningless, purposeless life. So there's this layer that's happening here. And then there's this other part, which is totally different. And a lack of continuity, a lack, a lack of connection between the two. And even for the fact that you recognize that there's spiritual sense to it, but can't translate on the surface mind is also an indication that it had a deeper meaning, obviously. So again, to me, this indicates the potential the inner being is much more ready, much more receptive for whatever reason Sri Aurobindo points out, it is often the case of the hard outward turn given by education and life circumstances, which hides, conceals the deeper spiritual readiness. And if you are able to reverse that, teach your consciousness to be able to withdraw from this hard outward superficial turn, and withdraw, turn in, and turn inward. First, use the reference of your own deeper soul's aspiration and its influence. Turn from there to the experience, uh, the closeness felt with the presence of the divine, of the divine mother. In whatever way you're able to turn in this way, remain in that, immerse in that, but build on this every day. A little more each day, a little nudge more, a little deeper, a little more complete, and a movement of opening and self-giving becoming more and more complete each day in relation to the divine, in immersion with the soul's influence or the divine presence. Just work on this. The inner is ready. The outer by education has been given a hard outward turn. And as it starts turning, you'll find very rapidly the inner and outer will begin to meet and a bridge formed. And your whole inner spiritual life will open up rapidly. I think uh, there's not much more to say. There's only to be done. We go to the next question. And there, uh, Rick Bob. I had several experiences in my dream which have left a permanent memory with vivid details of environment, location, 
etc., some of which seem to defy laws of science, huge size of the mother filling my room, etc. These experiences I am able to recall every detail. Question, how can I integrate and learn from these experiences? Yes. It's a similar example of a rich inner life and somehow the outer is still not able to connect directly with it. So the fact of vivid recall from those dream experiences shows that what is happening within is very much not only real, but also close enough that you're able to recall. The missing element is the outer part being able to consciously open and maybe build a link to those inner layers where these experiences take place, which can begin with a very simple basic practice of meditation of the kind that I have already described. And once that begins, you'll find many things begin to integrate rapidly. You may also want to consciously follow a practice of recalling the dream and noting down in detail, but be careful not to bring the dream memory to the surface only. Rather, hold that in between stage. I mentioned this last time. You might want to review that. As you emerge from the dream state to the surface mind and translate into the physical brain memory, before translating, you hold that poise. From that poise, you will recall the dream state and the quality and grade of consciousness, which is much more fluid and plastic and real. You'll be able to recall that and stay in it. And then slowly infuse into the physical. And at that point, when you do this, you will not have this problem where you, you are perplexed that it defies the laws of science. The so to say laws of science are not laws. And science is very superficial in its understanding even of uh, what it knows. Uh, rather, we recognize the material world, a domain of matter is a domain of form. And therefore, rigidity of form is normal here. But the moment you shift in, even into the subtle physical, your subtle physical body is somewhat plastic. Sometimes it can grow large. Sometimes it can shrink and become weak and small. And you will experience that and you will see it. And in the dream state, obviously, that plasticity of form is what you're seeing. Huge size of the mother filling your room is because her presence is infinite. It is cosmic. It not only fills the whole universe, it transcends the universe, is larger than the universe and can embrace the universe and can even rise above space and time and embrace space and time itself from a poise outside. And each of these are, so to say, gradations on which you can meet the Divine Mother and relate to her or even experience her, con her presence as yours because you're a part of her. So this huge size of the Mother filling your room is only... The way your brain mind interprets the experience of her vastness as held in your smallness. Does that make sense? <laughs> your room is your little world, your little body consciousness and your small littleness. Her consciousness being large and registered, held in that. So if I had to give a symbolic analogy, this gigantic ocean and a little a wave top down leaning into your little consciousness your little bowl your little room which is your world on the physical level in the body and you're holding that but she's too big but the mind translates it into a physical form because it needs a physical form to be able to hold and recognize her which is fine and so that's how the dream is recognized i'd be interested to have heard other laws of science being defied but once you get the hang of this you'll find largely it has to do with sizes and shapes and the ability to meld uh, one shape into another and not being bound to rigidity of form and that would take care of the bulk of the nature of the experiences again the suggestion would be in your own deeper parts you are opening to a wider experience and intimacy of the mother's larger consciousness Take the trouble, the same guideline I've suggested before, take the trouble to consciously turn your awareness inward. Do some kind of a deeper practice of meditation where you bridge from the surface to the inner. To all those whom I have suggested this, I would say if it helps you, start from that guided meditation for descent of peace. It will give you immediately the sense of what it's like to be disengaged from the surface physical layers and be more immersed in your subtle physical body. 
and then being able to bridge these two and from the subtle physical awareness you'll find you can easily open to the deeper and wider full ranges because it is much more plastic much more conscious much more receptive so use that it could be a helpful starting point otherwise whatever works we'll go to the next question <clears throat> Tej Zaman, shall we go with this question or yes. Ash? Yeah, okay. Uh, so then she... <laughs> okay, maybe we'll keep it for later. Let me just look at the chat box. Yes. There are okay. quite a few things which have come. Mm. Yes, Tutun confirms that yes, the water was calm. Once she had jumped into it, everything had changed. Uh, Shiva shares, long ago, my recently deceased grandfather came in my dream and advised on how to deal with the property to avoid family tussles. The elders didn't listen and his dire prediction manifested. Yes, it's a fact that when people have just passed on and it's still recent, they're quite close to the material domain, they do try where they feel things have been left unfinished to convey a message. And unfortunately, because we live so physically identified that we only register these things in the dream state where we are not so physically bound in biology. And having received it, you come back to the waking consciousness and lose it. Imagine the frustration on their part. They come to you first while you're in this half-sleep dream state. They convey something which you barely register. If at all you register, you say, ah, yes, that's a good point. And foof, you go back into this half-sleep dozing state and then you wake up and you've forgotten everything. And perhaps they tried several times and then they give up. There's a very interesting uh, thing which Mark describes. Again, I come back to Mark Oberns. And many of you have asked, where can you buy it? And I've put the link in today's description. The website is deeptipublications.com. D-I-P-T-I, publications.com. And um, it's the only place you get Mark's book in English because it's the first time we have translated. Uh, he narrates this because, because of this ability that he had of uh, the opening to the subtle sight, obviously subtle sound. He would sometimes see these beings who had just passed on and they would want to pass a message through him to those who have uh, their family members. And of course, on his part, he just refused. He says, no, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I don't want to play this game. But he narrates incidents uh, here where occasionally it would happen where he felt it was needed. He was, for example, one narration he has, he was driving on the road and there's a girl who's a hitchhiker and he receives this suggestion that he has to stop for her. So he stops, takes her on. It turns out she has just lost her parents recently and her parents are trying to convey a message through him to her. So he just conveyed the message and then dropped her off. But uh, beyond that, he, he would just cut off and say, you know, you don't want to get into that trip because it's a very messy trip. But nevertheless, there are situations where it can be helpful. But the point I'm making is, yes, it does happen. They want to communicate. How can they? We are so deeply asleep in our waking state. And then when we go into dream state, it's the same sleep that we are con continuing in the dream state unconscious. We live unconsciously here and so our dream states are unconscious. If we become more conscious here, we can also become more conscious in the dream state. And in a sense, it's also a reflection of our spiritual growth. It does not mean in terms of what higher consciousness you access, but how much the higher consciousness is integrated with the surface layers. It's a measure of that. And when our surface layers have been sufficiently awakened, then that will also reflect in the dream state. So that's an interesting example that Shiva shares. <clears throat> Madhuri comments also how she saw her grandfather in dream at the time when he passed away. And the telegram uh, came later. And she says, a little child was in his lap and he was injected and was not more. I don't quite get that. Ah, okay. Then she heard the voice of her grandfather that he is no more. It was much more than a dream. 
Yes, exactly. Um, at the time when they leave the body, depend, there's a period initially of transition. It can take a few minutes, hours, or a few days, depending on the degree to which you have prepared yourself or are conscious on the other side. And once you're there, you might want to reach out to those who are loved. And again, you're free to wander in your subtle body. It's like an out-of-body experience, except now you don't come back to the physical body. There's not much difference. You go out, you meet the people you would want to, except that they are blind, deaf, and dumb, and asleep in their little uh, obsessed obsession of the little life. And you can only tap into them, if at all, in their uh, sleep bubble, as Mark describes. But if you're a little bit conscious, then you register it in dream state, in dream form, or otherwise, sometimes in vision form, and so on. Shiva's question, can one consciously enter another person and give a message in the dream while sting, still being alive? I would say you don't need to enter another person. You can convey the message as you are, even now, isn't it? Every time you think of someone, you are actually conveying there's a point of contact, isn't it? The problem is, first of all, when we have that, that's one of maybe thousands of automatic, mechanical, meaningless agitations and activities of your mind and thoughts. So effectively, your energy is dispersed in a thousand different connections. Think of all the things you're thinking. And this is the case for most people when you sit down to meditate, suddenly all the thoughts begin to pop up. No, you just become aware of all the thoughts which were mechanically happening anyway, which you were not aware of because you were busy with something else. That's the dispersal of energy you have. The first thing you would do is make your mind completely quiet or as quiet as you can. Then you can direct it to a particular thing. And then naturally it is an amplifier. It's a huge amplification of whatever it is you're directing your thought to. And then you can further develop the power of that communication. The problem on the other side is again, it's a chaotic noise. A little nudge coming in is not enough to have a registration. Unless the person was already intuitive or connected with you and then something may be registered or not. Or when registered, it is interpreted in various ways with their own forms. Unless the other side also, there is a sufficient clarity and receptivity, very likely you will not be able to get much. And then after all that, if you really try to communicate in this way, you are very likely going to be hacked. Because if you can communicate, some other being can impersonate and communicate. And unless the person has a deeper intuition, they would not be able to distinguish. So my point is, yes, it's possible. You can send a message. You can even send a message in dream state or even in non-dream state. The problem is more of the receptivity and the unreliability of any such communications. But what you can do, which is more useful perhaps, is when somebody is in distress or in some difficulty, you can send a wave of a vibration of support, calm, peace, or help of some kind, love, affection, light, to a person who is going through distress. And that would be received, even if not consciously, it would affect and influence their circumstance. Or even to somebody who is just disembodied, who has just left the body, and you can do the same. And it would have a far greater impact because they would be affected more intensely. Uh, Turbanless says, I had a dream when I was chanting Gayatri for a long time in my room. Then in my dream, my father came in and come and bless you. And I was furious and started scolding him. As I felt it was a negative entity taking his form. Then the next scene was in the kitchen where he was trying to attack and clench his feet ready for battle. But I was scared and the dream ended. Can I control the narrative? Can I stop dreams? Does a dream state create karma? Uh, if it comes to the question of karma, yes, everything creates ripples physically and of course in dream state. There is this very famous story in the Indian tradition of the king Harishchandra who gave his word and never broke his word and that was the great ideal at that point, at least in 
the larger revolution and so in dream state indra comes to him and asks for his kingdom and he gives his kingdom then he wakes up and in the physical domain king indra comes and says you promised to give your kingdom in the dream or our three boons and then as a result he is now sent into the most uh, horrible conditions and he's lost his kingdom etc so he has to stick to the word he gave in dream state that's the ideal of the story at least so <laughs> yes there are consequences but the question is if you give a word in a state of drunkenness does it apply was it really your word or the drink which was making you give your word and if in dream state you're unconscious and you make a commitment in that does it really bind you of course in the story perhaps harish chandra is conscious but then i would ask why would he promise something in that state i don't know but i'm just saying that it's really not too different out of body or in in within the body the difference is of grade of consciousness if in dream state you are just in this mechanical helpless uh, rush of subconscious impulses it has as little value as something done in that state in the physical consciousness if there is an intentional clear focus in dream state meditation state out of body state or in physical waking state it would have equivalent results perhaps or consequences but uh, to come back to turbulence dream the fear was that when this person came in the form of her father the fear was that it was some entity that had taken its place and then it clenched its fist its fist and got ready for battle so very likely it was one such you sensed it but it could also be a fear that it might be an entity which then creates a shift in the nature of the dream so all depends on whether it is purely a dream which is then a formation and a projection of your own consciousness or was it a reflection of an out of body experience that actually took place or a symbolic representation of something that actually took place doesn't matter the point is yes you can control the narrative you can stop the dream you can change the dream but that means you know you must work on becoming conscious or partially conscious in the dream state and we discussed that last time so i won't repeat but work on it and then you'll find you can direct your dreams in the dream state but you can also choose to have clearer positive higher dreams by changing the state in which you enter the sleep and finally what i said was the more you become conscious the more you live your life centered in a spiritual aspiration the more that state will continue in your dream that your dream also will be an expression of your spiritual aspiration and then things can happen or be done there which should actually be a continuation of your sadhana um revati speaks of being in a in the dream state where she could levitate and fly and things like that it's great fun yes because the subtle body is not It does not have weight so very often these are registrations of some activity in the subtle body semi consciously uh, experienced which then remain as the dream all of us have these dreams where we fly and especially when you are in a lucid dream the first thing you want to do is ah i'm conscious i'm dreaming that means i can fly and you choose to float and you float off Sandhya says almost every night i get two conflicting dreams one is full of love and sweet things like children and flowers another dream is full of negative things like violence killing war like situations and when i am about to get up the two dreams get mixed up i would say observe which layer the two dreams are taking place on different layers if you can recognize you don't have to give a name feel the quality of consciousness where this takes place and where that takes place very likely this negative dreams are happening in some gradation of the vital uh, consciousness and then if you can hold that quality of consciousness and in your waking state become aware of that grade within you 
and consciously turn that part and open it to a higher light and bring the light and peace into that part infuse and dissolve this disturbance the disturbance could be coming from two causes one that within you there is this tendency of agitation which could be from distress in relation to people or circumstances but in that layer is held that agitation or in that layer you are open to influences from outside which makes that when you go into that sleep state that layer which is relatively low and close to the physical opens out into the lower vital worlds and receives all these impressions or influences which then you register as the dreams either way if you are open then you learn to close if the agitation is within you then you would learn to quiet and calm it with peace and light brought in but if you are open on that level you will find in your life you will get suggestions and nudges on that level which will affect your behavior you might find in a situation where you would want to be quiet suddenly something rushing in seizing you and creating distress triggering conflict and so on but if you can correct that it will stop in the dream it will also stop in the waking state uh, this vulnerability will change <clears throat> Rampal asks, "What to do before you go to bed for protection?" Well, the one thing you do is to put yourself entirely and exclusively in relation to the divine. You can do this by turning of awareness. You can do it by an accompaniment of a visual. One way of doing the visual would be to, as if, feel the mother's presence. and surround yourself with it forming as if like a cocoon like a shell like a body or another way would be become aware of your own aura of your own consciousness which is cocoon shaped somewhat and open it to the mother's light and peace and force invoke her to fill you and surround you or even surround your aura surround your cocoon or become aware of her presence which is everywhere in the world and immersing yourself in it feel her wrapping you in her in her arms holding you like this child as you drift into sleep with your cocoon so you see there are many variations many ways one could do it whatever works for you easily i've just indicated a few and something may come to you spontaneously which may be your way but two elements are critical one is becoming aware of the totality of your awareness so it's not just one part that is in protection the rest exposed as much as possible the totality of your awareness you must become aware first and second is putting this whole of you or as much as you are able to get of the whole of you in relation to the divine which then envelops closes supports holds infuses fills the whole of you therefore entirely open to the divine exclusively given to the divine these two keywords come again and again but to whatever extent you are able to you put yourself in this relation and then slowly in that state you drift into sleep with the intention that this should stay throughout the night and generally that is enough very rarely there may be a part in you which has a persistent opening which is not included in this movement of opening and protection it has a persistent opening to something of a lower grade of other worlds and things leak in through that but when you persist in this gradually that part will be taken in or with a prayer a concentration for help where you are aware of that part you bring it in consciously into the domain of your wholeness give open and give yourself bit by bit this will be overcome but this would be the easiest way the form is secondary trying to see if there's anything else okay there are several questions which relate to the obe which we will take up next time with the out of body experiences and uh, that's it i think for today we can end with this idea that before you go to sleep you put yourself in relation to the divine mother for protection but then why not live in that state at all times isn't it think about it 
if we can start our day with the same intention becoming conscious of all we are all that we are about to do all that we intended to do take it all and open it to her invoke her light and force in you but also in the circumstances that you are going to engage with the whole of your day ahead of you and enter at least with this if possible during the day many times remember that recall that invoke the divine presence divine mother's help and force simply by remembering and turning opening here your help in this moment and then again you lose yourself in the work no problem and then at the end of the day a similar process where you gather all that was done in the day all the efforts you put all the work done take it all up and offer it to her and say now you act on this this is the effort put these are the energies put out for whatever outcomes that you thought best and open it to her and say now you act do what is needed combine this with yourself all of you taken up and put yourself now in her hands and say here i am also yours hold me carry me in your arms as i drift into sleep and slide into sleep So, in a sense, with some variation, the overall sense of the relationship with the divine, not only at the time of entry into sleep, but also at the time of beginning of the day, would be of help. And then perhaps many points of contact during the day. And this becomes naturally our uh, support in the sadhana. Let's hold this as an intention for those of you who feel inclined to put this into practice let's take this up as a practice at least for the coming few days through the rest of the week and if it helps you you might extend it into your life in some form or other let's all concentrate in this aspiration that the divine mother may carry us in her arms as we enter sleep but also as we enter our lives and in all activities in all efforts of our lives namaste namaste thank you <laughs>